Hi, my name is Anna Weissmeyer. I'm a researcher on the Xbox Research Accessibility Team. We partner with folks across Xbox to create more accessible products and services. Some of the teams we work with include first and second party studios, platforms and services teams, and the hardware team. Our goal is to use both classic user research methods and also some more creative experimental methods um, to support the accessible design work going on across Xbox. In today's presentation, I will start off with a brief description of how our team approaches accessibility user research. I will then follow that with some examples of how our user research has supported the design of accessibility features and Xbox games. Some of the methods we will cover will include some classic ones such as usability studies and surveys, and others will be adaptations that we've made for our, our accessibility work, including methods that have more community involvement such as community expert reviews, player connects, and inclusive design workshops. To conduct user research, you must, of course, first understand the population that you'll be working with. The most recent reports by the World Health Organization and the World Bank have found that over 1 billion people in the world have some type of disability. That's about 15% of the world's population, or between 1 in 7 and 1 in 8 people. In studies that our team has done with Xbox audiences, we found that about 20 to 30% of players identify as having at least one disability. That's between one in five and one in three gamers that we could be missing by not making our games accessible. Our studies also show that players with disabilities are more engaged with gaming than players without disabilities, and that gaming is more important to them in their lives, especially when it comes to mental health. But players with disabilities are not a monolith. They encompass a really wide range of diverse experiences and it's important to think about how that applies when you're doing user research. Everyone in the world has a range of abilities. It's not a dichotomy. For example, thinking about vision, there's a small group of people who are blind with no vision, but vision is a long spectrum of experiences and very few people have perfect eyesight and very few have no vision at all. In addition, just knowing that someone has a disability doesn't help you understand their lived experience. In our work, we wanted to focus on people's lived experiences so we could get a better idea of what their needs might be and how our products can best meet those needs. To learn about people's experiences from this community, we have done foundational research both through in-depth qualitative work such as interviews, as well as scoping work and audience insights through large-scale surveys. We still have a lot to learn, but knowing our population in this way has helped us to develop our perspectives on how we want to approach user research with and for this community. Our work has reinforced the idea that disabilities are neither binary nor static. It's not a matter of having a disability or not, but of how the world does or does not meet your needs. And there's a diverse spectrum of needs across the disability community. For example, a player in one of our studies described their experience playing games on their TV screen. The quote here says, I'm not blind enough to see need narrator, but I don't have enough sight to see the screen from far away, so I have to sit close. For this player, narrator is not going to be helpful and it's not gonna meet their needs, but potentially something like a magnifier feature might do a better job of meeting their needs. People's abilities also change over time, both over the long term, for example, as a person loses their visual acuity over their lifespan, or in the short term, such as when someone's migraines prevent them from getting out of bed. In order to meet their needs, we need to start to focus on finding out what those needs are. Traditionally, people have used four large categories or groups to talk about disability, vision, mobility, auditory, and cognition. And in product development, teams sometimes come to us with the goal of designing for one of these four groups or communities. But unfortunately, not only are people with disabilities not a homogenous group of people, but they also don't usually fit into single categories. What we find is that most people report having more than one disability. Someone may be deaf or hard of hearing and may also have low vision. To design subtitles for someone who is both deaf and has low vision, 
You would want to take into account their need for visual information to convey the same information provided by any sounds. And you would also want to think about how to present that visual information in a way that they will be able to easily perceive it. There's also often a strong and very well-intentioned desire to figure out the feature that will assist a player with disabilities to play the game as a player without the disability might play it. To do this, teams will want to find out what a person's disability is and then what they are not able to do, and then fix that disability by providing a feature that will allow them to do what they need to to play the game. However, in contrast, we like to approach disability and accessible design from a different perspective of how a product can best meet people's needs through accessible design from the start, without the need for assist to enable players to play the game. We want to make the world or game fit our players rather than asking our players to use features to help them fit the world. We were inspired to adopt our perspective on disability, both from the awesome work of the inclusive design team at Microsoft, who created the Microsoft Inclusive Design Kit, which is publicly available online, so I highly recommend you check that out. Um, but also from community sources, such as this statement from the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. The quote on the slide reads, Disability results from the interaction between persons and attitudinal and environmental barriers that hinder their full participation in society. Our take on this perspective is that disability is a mismatch between a person and their environment, rather than something that's endemic to the person themselves. Here's an example of how our perspective changes the way that we think about accessible design. On this slide, there's a screenshot from a hilarious drunk history sketch on YouTube featuring comedian Zach Anner. In the image, there's a set of stairs, and at the bottom, there's a person in a wheelchair. That's Zach Anner and a man in a suit standing next to him. We will sometimes present this image to game teams and ask them what they think the disability in the image might be. Most people will say that it might be the diagnosis of the person in the wheelchair, or maybe the man in the suit has an invisible disability. But most people are surprised when we tell them that what we think of as the disability in the image is the stairs. Think about it. If we lived in a world where all of us used wheelchairs to get around, we wouldn't build any stairs. All our buildings would likely have ramps and lifts or other ways that we could access levels and buildings. This building was designed without consideration for the full range of experiences and needs of the people who might need to access it. Our goal is to design buildings, or games in this case, that anyone can enter or exit, which means that we need to sample from the full range of people who might need or want to do so. And that means including players with a wide range of disabilities and experiences in our research. When it comes to our games and other products, we encourage studios to think about designing their features and experiences with that full range of human experiences in mind from the start. As I mentioned before, another element to consider is that needs and abilities are not static. We tend to think of people as falling into one bucket or another. Either they have sight or they don't, and that's the bucket they stay in. But that's not how it works in the real world. One of the concepts that the Microsoft Inclusive Design Kit teaches is to consider how disabilities might be permanent, temporary, or even situational. For example, for mobility. There are plenty of gamers who have lost limbs, but many of us have also been in a sling for several weeks and been unable to use one of our limbs. Or you might be a new parent carrying a baby and can only use one of your limbs. Um, or maybe you're holding a beer or even your groceries, right? So there are many different kinds of situations that might put you in a position of having similar needs. So while the actual number of gamers with limited mobility might be relatively small, the number of people with a particular need grows quite a bit when you think across the spectrum of people with permanent, temporary, or situational conditions that result in similar needs. By considering people's needs first and foremost, we can also avoid the issue of forcing people to claim identities that don't fit them just to get their needs met. Many players who are diagnosed with conditions affecting their lives do not identify as people with disabilities, but they may have similar needs to those who do. This is changing, but especially true of people with invisible disabilities. There is still a lot of stigma against identifying as a person with a disability. And unfortunately, that stigma means that people may not learn about or even consider resources that could greatly improve their quality of life. For example, I don't identify as having an auditory disability, 
but I'm very sound sensitive. This means that I generally rely on subtitles because I tend to listen to media at very low volumes. However, prior to educating myself about accessibility features as part of my job, I would have never thought to look for subtitles in an accessibility menu or to activate something like a preset for players who are deaf or hard of hearing, even though that might actually apply to my condition. Uh, for example, if there were features that provided visual cues for auditory information, I would totally turn those on. And prior to being in the field of accessibility, I wouldn't have known to do that or that they even existed. Across multiple studies, we've seen folks with chronic pain conditions, dyslexia, and post-traumatic stress disorder, all of whom whose experiences improve with the use of features designed for accessibility, but who do not identify themselves as a person with a disability. By focusing on people's needs, you can design more robust features that anyone with a similar need can use. There are tons of examples of accessible design being beneficial for everyone, and this is something that is highlighted in the Microsoft Inclusive Design Toolkit as well. For example, curb cutouts. Those were originally designed for people using wheelchairs, but I've used them for strollers, bikes, or while schlepping a giant wheelie bag around a busy city. Here's a game-specific example, subtitles, a feature that when turned on by default is generally used by a majority of players. And by majority, we mean almost everybody. <laughs> Another one that often gets our product teams is audio controls. These features are used by people with auditory, visual, and cognitive disabilities, which of course also includes people with mobility or physical disabilities, since they too have visual, auditory, and cognitive disabilities. If you're starting to sense a trend here, that's probably because there is one. So how do we apply this approach to user research? Well, first and foremost, we found that recruiting by disability is not usually our best approach and almost never a useful approach on its own. Instead, we recruit by asking people about their needs first. We do this by asking two recruitment questions. One of the questions is about what features people use or rely on when playing games. We came up with a long list of features that people commonly use to improve their experience during gameplay. We then adjust the list based on what research questions we're looking to answer. For example, if we're asking about the usability of subtitles for a game, we recruit people who rely on subtitles during gameplay. If we're interested in people's experiences with features that help them adjust sensitivity, we ask about whether they use features such as dead zone settings or precision assist such as aim assist, or whether they adjust the sensitivity of their controls when playing games. We may also then cross-reference the feature use question with the demographics question, such as a disability question, um, or sometimes other demographics such as race, ethnicity, age, or gender, to ensure that we capture a representative range of experiences in our sample. Intersectionality is key. We try to keep in mind that people do not exist in a vacuum, and even though we are focusing on accessibility research, people's needs can be affected by many different factors, both by their disability identity, but also by their other identities. For example, we sometimes receive requests from studios to test many or gameplay narration with blind players specifically. However, what we explain is that what they really want to know is if people who rely on screen narration will be able to use and enjoy their narration feature. So instead of recruiting players who identify as blind, we recruit by asking people if they rely on screen narration for gameplay. By doing this, we are directly targeting users of this feature rather than making assumptions about who those users might be. If we were only recruiting by disability, we would have to make an assumption about who will use a feature and that assumption may be incorrect or maybe you won't capture the needs of the population who actually end up being the primary users of a feature. Here's another example. Think about a feature like an aim assist. Some folks might think that this feature is primarily for people with mobility disabilities affecting their hands or arms. However, Players with low or no vision may also make use of aim assist features if they are unable to use sounds to aim or if they would rather not rely on sounds. People with cognitive disabilities might use an aim assist to reduce anxiety in combat situations or may use it because they are too overwhelmed by other visual information to accurately aim during gameplay. 
People with auditory disabilities might use aim assist if there are sound dependencies in the game that put them at a disadvantage. One can't assume that all these groups will use the feature in exactly the same way. And testing the feature with just one group would be like only testing your cooking game with women because you think women are more likely to want to play a cooking game. In games user research, we would recruit on people who like playing cooking games, regardless of gender, and not make the assumption of who that might be. It's no different for accessibility. Another thing that is critical to consider is making connections to the community. You can't test with players with disabilities if you don't have a way of getting them access to your games. At Xbox Research, we've made inroads into having participant sourcing through two different channels. Uh, the first one was the one that our team created. It's called the Xbox Research Accessibility Community Feedback Program. Players can sign up for this program by joining through by taking a survey. Um, and once they're joined with this program, they get access to um, emails about opportunities to uh, participate in research uh, for that has an accessibility focus across our games and other products such as platforms and services and hardware. Um, another way that players can participate in our research is through the new X Xbox Accessibility Insider League, which launched this year. Um, the Xbox Accessibility Insider League is also open to anyone who wants to join. Uh, all people need to do is download the Insider Hub app on either their console or their PC, um, and they will get access to flights that are specific to um, specifically looking for accessibility feedback from the community. These two channels have allowed us to bring in people from all over the world, especially now in this remote world, um, where we can do things virtually um, much more seamlessly than we were able to pre-pandemic. Um, and because of this, we're able to get you know, community expert reviews with folks from across the world, including like Portugal and the UK and Germany, and of course the US. Um, and with the Insider League, we're able to flight uh, game experiences and get a sense for how the community um, is going to be able to make use of those. All right, up until this point, I've really focused on explaining how our team approaches accessibility, how we think about disability, and how that affects our recruitment strategies and the way we approach our research questions and testing. Now I'd like to give you a little bit of some brief descriptions of case studies of where user research has supported our game studios in some of their accessibility feature designs. The first example I'm going to cover today is Grounded. Grounded studio team, Obsidian, worked really hard with research to develop something called arachnophobia safe mode. In arachnophobia safe mode, there's a slider scale located in the game's options menu that allows players to change the look and sounds of the spiders in the game. The gameplay and the difficulty remain unchanged um, regardless of where you place the slider. There are options for things like removing the spider visuals altogether, uh, reducing the legs of the spiders uh, to just four legs rather than eight, uh, removing all spider legs as you see here, um, removing the spider mesh so that it's just simple shapes, um, and changing the spider materials to simple colors with shiny textures. Um, the numbers of eyes, legs, fur, and even the sounds of the games can be adjusted. Um, and one of the things, uh, the, one of the reasons that Obsidian did this is because they were really concerned about players who experience arachnophobia um, being unable to play the game. They noticed at launch that there were players who were like, oh, that's a really fun jump scare. And then there were other players who were like, oh, wow, yeah, no, I'm not going to be able to play that if those are in there. To develop this feature, the Obsidian team had to figure out what would be the most impactful features for players to be able to control for them to be able to play their game. And at first, they weren't really sure what that might be. So they partnered really closely with our Xbox research team. And Derek Flores, who is a game designer, has a quote in a GameSpot article, which is here on the slide. We worked with the research team to figure out what would trigger those fearful reactions. So the user research team, Deanne Adams and Blake Pellman, 
actually built various spider models, some with less eyes, some with less legs, some with hair, some without hair, and thought about all the features that might be spider-like features that might make a person uh, with arachnophobia uh, be fearful of the game. And they showed people in an in-person study, uh, much like a usability study prior to the pandemic taking place. They would show people images and get a sense for what were the features that were really impacting people's perceptions of the shapes as being spiders rather than being floating circular shapes as you see here. Once they got a sense for which were the most impactful features, they were, they were able to conduct multiple online surveys worldwide once the lockdowns began during the pandemic. And through these surveys, they were able to scope out which of these features needed to be customized um, to be able to keep people safe during gameplay. One of the things that they had to take care in, con in conducting this research was actually that they had to care for their participants. Remember that the participants they're testing with are people who rely on a feature to remove spiders from their game. So they don't want to expose their participants to their phobia triggers in a way that would be harmful to them. So one of the things they did is they devised a way of giving participants control of when the images would be revealed to them so that an image would never be revealed to them if they weren't ready. And of course, they could always quit at any point in time. And this combination of methods actually eventually led Obsidian to solidify the types of sliders available in the demo of Grounded that was released back in mid-June. So here's an example of how classic user research methods, usability and surveys, were used to test an accessibility feature, arachnophobia safe mode, and support the design team in creating a feature that was both usable and impactful for players playing their game. While classic user research methods like usability, interviews, focus groups, surveys are all really great ways to support game design teams in creating new accessibility features for their players or in designing accessible games from the start, we found that flexibility in our methodology is really helpful in terms of helping our studios get a better sense of what those lived experiences are for players with disabilities. One of the ways we've done this is by figuring out methods where we can put studio teams in direct contact with players with disabilities so that they can deep dive during their feature development. One of those methods is called Player Connects. In Player Connects, we connect between two to three players with disabilities with game development teams to have targeted, facilitated conversations. Um, the user researcher is generally the facilitator or moderator um, and helps to keep the conversation on track um, and take notes for the, the development team so that they can refer to them afterwards. Um, these conversations are great ways for development teams to get a really deep sense of what uh, specific experiences might be like. Um, so for example, um, learning about how to communicate in ASL and what the lived experience is of trying to watch media um, with picture-in-picture -picture ASL or maybe when that's not present as well. Um, another thing, uh, topic that we've covered in Player Connects is things about like how to navigate in game environments using only sound um, and what kinds of sounds people are looking for, um, what's missing generally in their experiences, things like that. Um, another method we use is called our community expert reviews or expert reviews. Um, in these reviews, we invite two to three of our most engaged players and advocates with disabilities to partner with two to three researchers to review early design concepts and ideas. Um, in this way, the studio is able to get very early design feedback, like literally sometimes as early as, hey, we just had an idea. What do you guys think? Is this on track? There's no prototype. There's no wireframe. We don't even have a, like a sketch of what this might look like. Um, all the way to you know full game menu and UI for review. Um, that's a prototype that we're able to kind of click through and 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 play around with and see how it actually interacts. Um, you know, the, one of the best things that I love about this methodology um, is first of all that we have community members right there. So rather than speaking for them, we're amplifying their voices. Um, and another thing is just how flexible this is and what a great and fast turnaround it provides so that we can get really quality, um, really rich, deep information for our teams um, in a fast and iterative way throughout uh, feature development. Another one of the methods that we've come up with is called inclusive design workshops. 
These are 15 hour workshops in which design teams get to talk directly to players. Um, they actually interview four players with disabilities that are usually advocates from the community uh, so that they can speak to a breadth of experiences from the community. The studio members who do the interviews then take the insights that they learn from those interviews with players into game uh, design through facilitated ideation and prioritization sessions. Uh, now I'm going to go uh, into a little bit more detail about each of these methods and share some examples of game accessibility features that were a direct result of using these methods with our game studio teams. The first example I'm going to cover here is the Gears 5 navigation ping in escape mode. In Gears 5, um, the escape mode, there is an audio ping that allows players to orient themselves and navigate through the different um, maps and, and areas. Um, the design for this feature actually kicked off with some conversations with a consultant, one that some of you may know, named Sightless Combat. Um, and the uh, coalition, uh, the makers of Gears 5, um, worked very closely with Sightless Combat to try to figure out what were the kinds of audio um, cues that he was missing in order to play through this level. Um, but they didn't stop there. They also followed up with community members through our expert review um, and customer connect. Um, they actually had players play through the feature. Um, so they actually played through the game without the feature, and then they played through the game with the feature turned on while the development team members were watching. And afterwards, we did a facilitated conversation with the players about their experiences using um, the feature um, and also with the feature turned off. Um, and the community feedback had immediate impact on feature development. So here we see, you know, this uh, designing for one and then extended for many um, kind of inclusive design principle at work. Um, the biggest uh, impact that that community feedback had was actually that in the first iteration of the feature, um, it was only active when the player had TACCOM on. This meant that for someone needing persistent assistance, so needing that ping feature on constantly, they had to be spamming the TACCOM button pretty much constantly. Um, and this was definitely unnecessary. And it had some negative consequences. So you can't run while the TACCOM is turned on. Uh, so players who were trying to um, turn it on so that they could access the, the feature actually weren't able to run at the same time. So the team was actually able to add an option for the feature to be turned always on, um, in addition to having the option to only have it on during TACCOM. Um, so, and then beyond that, they, asked, they started thinking about, well, what are other ways we can customize this feature? Um, and they actually ended up having four different options for how this ping feature can function. Um, for players within the game. Um, and then finally, they actually took uh, all of this development work and they also flighted it to um, the Xbox Accessibility Insiders League to get additional community feedback um, and then continue improving upon the feature. Um, so they really combined a lot of the different methods that I've talked about here, um, all ways in which they could engage the community directly and get that feedback straight from uh, community members who are interested in using this feature directly. So one of the last methods I'm going to talk about today are these inclusive design workshops, probably one of the most in-depth methods that we use in terms of education with the Xbox Game Studio teams. Um, it's a structured way to immerse our development teams in the framework of inclusive design and accessible design using our own expertise and the infrastructure of Xbox research. Um, on the face of it, it's to you know, help them develop ideas to make their games more accessible so they love this idea. Um, but under the surface, it's also a culture change mechanism. It's a way to teach teams how to think about their game through an accessible design lens. Um, and think about it from the perspective of players with disabilities and what that might mean. Um, 
The traditional structure for this workshop is two full workshop days, um, but with uh, the necessity of having to do these remotely and virtually, uh, we've actually been able to be a lot more flexible for studios who may not have people who can actually spend um, two consecutive whole days. We have exploded versions that are across four mornings over one to two weeks. Um, we can often tailor the uh, exact format and structure to the studio's uh, needs and their availability. So first off, let me describe a little bit about who attends these workshops. Um, of course, we invite the dev team. Um, and by the development team, we actually mean that we encourage studios uh, to bring people from lots of different disciplines at the studio to attend the workshops. Um, you know, for the smaller studios, pretty much everybody can attend. Um, but for some of our larger studios, we encourage um, a mix of you know, designers, developers, producers, audio engineers, artists, etc. Um, we find that studios can benefit a lot from having a wide array of members attend, both because they get to share um, in seeing each other's perspectives and how, that, how accessibility um, and accessible design in particular affects each one of them. Um, but it also means that when they get back to the studio, they're able to champion and evangelize accessibility um, in a much wider network. Um, we also like to invite leads from the studio, we find that it really helps to push that culture change. Uh, we've received feedback and observed ourselves that the teams that do have leadership attend and do have them really active in the process are gonna be more successful in continuing on their accessible design journey after the inclusive design workshop. We, of course, invite some advisors. Um, so we've created relationships with 30 to 40 game accessibility advocates with diverse backgrounds from all over the world um, who partner with us in our inclusive design workshops. Um, the advisors are usually advocates um, and games journalists, bloggers, reviewers, streamers, um, or otherwise have experience playing and evaluating games from an industry perspective. Um, and this really helps us because they're able to talk about accessibility in games, both from their own personal experiences, because they're all players with disabilities themselves, but also from a much broader perspective in terms of how it impacts others um, in uh, the gaming and disability community. And last but not least, we do have a set of facilitators to help with all of the interviews. Um, so interviewing is a skill. And so to support our teams, so even though the, the dev teams are actually the ones asking the questions with the players, uh, with our advisors, um, researchers with experience in accessibility and interviewing um, are there to support the people attending the workshop um, in creating interview guides, in interviewing the advisors directly, and sometimes needing to, you know, moderate uh, the dis conversation itself and kind of nudge them back uh, in the direction um, of the questions that they were interested in getting answered. Um, and of course, for the rest of the sessions, when they're doing design ideation and prioritization, the facilitators are there to help them synthesize their insights across those interviews. So you might be wondering, what exactly do development teams do during inclusive design workshops? Well, first off, we need to give our development teams the basic skills and guidelines on how to conduct interviews with people with disabilities. So we do a really short introduction to what some of those basic skills and guidelines are, and then we split up the participants into small groups so they can sit with their facilitators and plan for their interviews. The facilitators will help them organize and structure their conversation to make sure that they're hitting the kinds of questions that they might be interested in. For example, if a team is building a multiplayer experience, they might want to focus on the advisor's multiplayer experiences, such as who they game with, uh, what have been the most impactful solutions, what might have been the most major blockers for them. Once they're done planning and organizing with their facilitator, they start the interviews. They move through four different interviews, each with one advisor. Each interview is approximately 45 to 50 minutes long. During the interviews, the team members have semi-structured conversations with the advisors, covering more generic topics like gaming habits, likes, dislikes, um, what does a daily gaming session look like for the advisor, as well as their planned interview questions. After the, individual, after the interviews, they're given time to individually reflect on what they've learned through the interviews and write down their individual insights on now virtual sticky notes. This is in preparation for the next day of activities. The next day, 
starts with an analysis of those individual insights that they wrote down after their interviews. During the analysis, we group the team's insights into themes on a virtual whiteboard, and pretty soon we start to see a story of what the studio learned together. After the analysis session, people split back up into their groups for ideation. The idea here is for them to take the insights and themes that we identified in the analysis session and apply those to accessibility ideas for their game. We encourage teams not to worry about resources or funding, but to think about what ideas they would want to design based on what they've learned through their interviews with the advisors. Finally, the groups all share their ideas to each other, and we end the workshop with a discussion about prioritization and accessibility planning for the development team. You might be wondering how much a single team can learn and ideate from just for interviews. It's a lot. Here's an example of a portion of wall covered in sticky notes from just one analysis session with a single development team. Teams have dozens of ideas that come out of these workshops, and we received really positive feedback about how much these workshops help to not only drive new accessibility feature design and development, but also how much it helps teams to start shifting their culture around accessibility. Here's an example of a feature that came directly from an inclusive design workshop. State of Decay 2 is a zombie survival horror game. The team wanted to add more difficulty levels to make their game accessible to more players. They decided to make a lighter, easier difficulty mode but they had learned through the inclusive design workshop that calling it easy sometimes feels denigrating to players. So instead, they decided to call it the green zone. They also created a live stream and video spot that clearly explained how the difficulty level was different from the others and what changed, because they learned that from the inclusive design workshop too. Here's another example of a feature that came directly from an inclusive design workshop. Sea of Thieves from Rare Studio is a multiplayer game where players team up as pirates, navigating boats and finding or sometimes stealing treasure. The team learned about players' needs to reduce buttonholds, especially in multiplayer games, when it's harder for them to take breaks or pause to alleviate pain, alleviate pain during gaming sessions. Sea of Thieves also makes use of the notoriously inaccessible mechanic, the radio menu which the development team also learned about during the inclusive design workshop. During ideation and discussion, the team realized that they could actually alleviate those issues sooner rather than later. And now I'm happy to share that they not only have multiple options to reduce buttonholes throughout the gameplay, but they also have a set, set a new industry standard for radial menus. There's no holding necessary. And they've also included single stick gameplay. In recent accessibility studies that we've conducted, players have spontaneously commented that they've returned to the game Sea of Thieves explicitly because of its new accessibility features. Our goal with inclusive design workshops is to catch development teams early in the development process to enable them to design with accessibility in mind from the start or bake it in. Borrowing this example from the awesome Morgan Baker, accessibility lead at The Odd Gentleman, if someone asked you to make blueberry muffins and you gave them a muffin with blueberries on top, they might think, okay, well, at least there's blueberries, but that's not really a blueberry muffin. The blueberries need to be part of the muffins or baked in from the start. I like this metaphor as well because you can extend it to the fact that the inclusion of the blueberries might mean that the batter and baking times might need to change. You can't just make a regular muffin and shove blueberries in and expect it all to come out well. It's the same with accessible design. It needs to be baked into the design in the first place. And designing accessible products means that the product won't necessarily look or function in the same way as other similar products. Adding accessibility features in at the end of product development means that yes, those features are there and that is great, but it's not accessible design from the start. Here's an example of a design team that baked in colorblind design from the start. They weren't an Xbox studio at that time, but I still think it's a great example of accessible design. When Obsidian made the Outer Worlds, they wanted to create a world that was accessible to people with colorblindness. This was in part because members of their team are colorblind. 
The traditional way to do this is to add colorblind filters that people with colorblindness can turn on if they need it. And having those filters available is definitely a step in the right direction. But it's an implementation that is asking players to adapt to the game world with a fix, rather than creating a game world that is already accessible. And unfortunately, filters do not always provide the best experience. The experiences and needs of people with colorblindness are diverse, even within the same colorblind type. Filters change all or many of the colors on the screen, depending on the type of filter. Sometimes this means that not only do the colors end up looking terrible, but sometimes colors that were fine without the filter are now indistinguishable with the filter. Players are then forced to choose which set of colors they can do without. Obsidian chose to take a different approach. They designed a game that would not need color filters. The Outer Worlds was designed to be playable in grayscale, meaning that no information is indicated by color alone. Josh Sawyer from the Obsidian team wrote, the Outer Worlds does not have a colorblind mode because it was designed to be playable without color information. Color information is redundant with other indicators. This is the kind of accessible design we hope to support and encourage through our many user research touch points with our studios. Finally, I want to end with a quote that has now become one of the slogans or mantras for the disability rights movement. On this slide is the quote, nothing about us without us. Inclusive and accessible design puts people in the center from the very start of the development process. When experiences don't serve people the way they should, people adapt, sometimes in astonishing ways that designers never would have thought of. We encourage all games user research teams to start talking to the developers they work with about how they can start to build accessibility into the development of their game. You don't need any fancy new methods or tools, just the usual set of people-focused user research methods and, you know, a willingness to step into spaces that you may be less comfortable or experienced with and learn from the gaming and disability community. That's the end of my presentation. I hope that it's helped give you an idea either of how you can start to bring accessibility into the user research that you are already engaged in or how to expand upon the accessibility user research you are already conducting. Please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you. All this is possible thanks to our sponsors, Playtest Cloud, Play Your Research, Balsamic, Adobe, the book, How to Be a Games User Researcher, UX is Fine, Antidote, and Sketch.